think I was asked to speak on this particular panel about mandatory arrest to put a personal face on it because I think so often in this field we think about policies and laws that can make us as a society feel better, like we're doing something about the problem. And I would like to think that we, our legislators and legal folks and uh, police force and everybody are trying to do what is in the best um, interest of society as well as keeping us and women in need of safety, safer. However, in our particular case, my family's case, um, that's not what happened, and I wanna tell you about what happened. And I wanna just start with two things. The first is, I really believe that marriage and family life is a very complex thing. I am trained as a marriage and family therapist by background. I also have a master's in public health. I, my, my primary work is in the area of public health. And I tend to have a bias towards looking at things systemically. And so I very much understand the push-pull that happens in relationships and similar dynamics that happen with kids. And I think it's all very complex when two people love each other and especially when there's children involved and the grind and the caffeine that it takes to get through every day, at least in my case. <laughs> Um, and the second thing I want to say, at least emphatically for me, is that I'm not a victim. I know that in this paradigm that I would be referred by many of you as a victim of domestic violence. Um, and I think as you hear my story, you'll probably understand that a bit better. But I really um, discard that term for myself. I, I don't know what other women think. Um, but I'm a, I'm a feminist, very much so my entire life. Um, I am a political activist, I'm a career woman, I'm educated, and, and at least in my case, and, and I'll tell you more, I don't really wanna be called a victim, nor do I really like to think of my husband who I love very much, I don't like to think of him as a perpetrator. During my training as a therapist, I received a lot of training about domestic violence and about the cycle of violence and about what families that are experiencing domestic violence look like and how to treat them. And I would never have pegged our family as one of those families. Um, it's, it's shocking to me that I ended up in the situation I did as it probably will be to you. I saw a lot of so-called victims of domestic violence and I thought about the same stereotypes that we probably all have about what quote battered women look like, how those women act. And I wanna say that over the course of my 16 years with my husband, we did not have a history of violence in our, in our relationship during that entire time. And I would have never imagined that I would have been in a domestic violence situation myself. As I was putting out the food, I heard my husband in our stairwell, which kind of has a tendency to echo, and I heard him shouting and clearly really upset with the dog. And so I opened the door to our downstairs, planning to step through the threshold and offer him some help. At seeing me for the first time that day, and he does this every night when I come home, he got even more and more excited. And my husband was holding him by the collar, and please know that this dog is 100 pounds and a little bit on the fat side. And so this huge, big Labrador retriever is jumping up and down, and this enormous picture got knocked off the wall in the process. Glass shattered everywhere. My husband lost it in frustration, and he began punching my dog. And in our marriage, it's my dog because I was the one that chose to get the dog. So, I was of course worried about the dog. I was really upset at my husband for losing it with him. And in what I thought was an attempt to help the dog, I also grabbed him by the collar and tried to pull the dog up the stairs. In the process, I had on high heels, which I'm not the most adept in. I slipped on the stairs and I fell backwards. When the dog wouldn't move and my husband was still hitting and yelling and really upset, I tried to, again, I thought helping and in retrospect, it was probably the biggest mistake I made that day. I tried to kick my husband in the thigh and move him away from the dog. I'm not exactly sure what happened next. When my husband and I talk, have talked about this since then, he thought that I had kicked him in the face. I thought that I had kicked him in his thigh. But both of us agree that in the scuffle, my husband, who has very poor vision, his glasses fell off, and he can't see at all without them. So he tried to pu push me out of the way. 
he too lost his balance on the stairs. And in the process, he thought he was pushing me away. I had on a different pair of glasses that evening. They were wire rimmed and he struck me in the face. During the course of this, and again, I'm not sure exactly how it happened and what the body positions were, my glasses cut me really deeply on my left temple. I still have a scar there. There was blood everywhere. And immediately my husband had this mortified look on his face and he started apologizing and we both were completely in shock. And at first I thought, oh, I've just been hit and I was just gonna sit down and try to like problem solve and think about what to do next. But then it was, that was when I saw the blood everywhere and um, I actually have some emergency responder training and I looked in the mirror and immediately knew I was gonna have to have stitches that there wasn't anything I could do at home to take care of this. So I called the doctor, I was told to go to the ER. My husband drove me to the hospital. I was sad and incredulous at what had happened. I was holding a dish towel the whole time trying to stop the bleeding. When we got to the hospital, I told the triage and the nursing staff about the dog, about the scuffle, that I had kicked my husband in the thigh and that my husband had hit me through a series of slips on the stairs and that it was an accident. I also knew because I happened to work for the health system where I was receiving treatment, which is only makes things a little complicated, um, that there were family violence programs available here. I'd actually been the project manager on those family violence programs several years prior. And the big message that I learned when I'd worked on this program was, if you just ask for help, then we're gonna refer you to social services so that your family can, get, can be better and not have to be in this cycle of violence that so many families are unfortunately in. And sad to say, I was really naive, and so I told the truth in the doctor's, in the emergency room, to the nurse, to the ER doc. I didn't know that there was a mandatory arrest policy on the books in California. The doctor stitched me up and asked if I wanted to press charges. I said no. We were told that um, I, some medication would be brought in for me and that we would then get to go home. This seemed to take a really long time, and the next thing I know, two police officers walked into the treatment room. The police took my husband out of the room and started peppering me with questions. They asked me if anything like this had ever happened before with my husband, and I said, no, they, it hasn't, not ever. And one officer looked at me and said, yeah, right. The other officer said, you, they said that during the midst of the questioning that um, we hate to tell you this, but we've taken your husband away and arrested him. And all I have to say is you're only bruised and cut this time, but you better be careful because you could be dead next time. As I was speaking and they were asking me questions, the officers took my statement. They later asked me to review the statement and sign it. But, and they said that I couldn't go home and be back with my kids until I signed the statement. I was unbelievably shaken up. And as I'm reading the statement, I said, there's things in this report that I didn't say. And they said, well, you have to sign it anyway. I wasn't lucid enough at that time to figure out that I really probably didn't have to sign the statement, but I did, being worried that now it had been hours and hours that I've been away from my kids. I was traumatized, I wanted to go home, and I was freaked out because my husband had a brand new job, had to be way out of town, about three hours away, 7 a.m. the next morning, and all I could think about is he's in jail, he's gonna lose his job, and there goes our financial stability. I begged the officers, I explained the situation with the job, um, clearly that didn't work, and they told me that this arrest was for my own good and that he would be in jail until at least eight o'clock the next morning when he would have a hearing before the judge and then it was up to the judge. I was also told that for my own good, that there was gonna be a temporary restraining order for five days for my husband so that we could quote, cool off. I said that I didn't really want a restraining order that we needed to work this out and figure out what to do next, particularly how was he gonna get to work. And the police said I didn't have a choice about it. The next events are a huge blur, but I do know that that evening that we posted, in fact, I went down to the jail myself and posted $8,000 in bail so that he could then get out to go to his job so that we actually could pay our mortgage. And when I thought the TRO was gonna uh, expire after five days, I found out through a friend who was in contact with my husband and helping to help him, 
um, that the judge was so upset by the situation that she made the TRO indefinite and demanded another $5,000 in bail. For a middle-income middle family, this was a huge amount of money and it created a huge strain on us. While I was still out of town, my husband found an attorney in the Yellow Pages. He picked one that just happened to be close to his work. When I got back from my trip, that was when the court date happened, and the attorney charged us $5,000 to basically do the minimum and to appear with us in court. Please know that we still at this point had not been able to speak to one another, so I was having to do everything through friends, and we are in court together, not able to really figure out what the best thing was for our family. We were pressured by this particular attorney to accept a plea bargain that would mean that my husband would accept um, pleading guilty to a felony which would mean three to five years of probation. And we actually felt hamstrung at this point because we didn't know what was gonna happen next and he said this was the best deal we were gonna get and so we took it. The felony charges are scheduled to go for three to five years. They're due, it'll be this coming May that the three years is up so we have the, um, I guess, privilege of getting to pay another $2,500 to an attorney to go before a judge this May in hopes that we can then get his um, charges reduced to a misdemeanor. I say privileged because we you know, can do this. I know there's families for which that wouldn't be possible. And I wanna honor and acknowledge them. The parole process has been extremely arduous for a while. He was having to go in once a month for mandatory visits with a pro probation officer. I guess it's probation, not parole, sorry. Um, and drug tests. And this eventually got reduced down to seeing the probation officer every six months because we went back to court to have to dispute the once a month. My husband recently was laid off from his job and this happened right before the holidays. And I just wanna say that he works in, um, in IT, high security field. A felony on your record is a problem when you're trying to get hired. And the job that he ended up taking, and he is fortunate to actually have a job as I stand here today, he took a job that's less than optimal for him because it was the job that wouldn't do a background check on him because we couldn't afford for him to not get a job right now during this period. And both of us will raise a huge, breathe a huge sigh of relief in May when we can hopefully get this reduced and he can then actually um, fully seek out a job and probably take the job that is a better fit for his skills and background. In summary, I know that the system, legal and police, were trying to help, but I felt completely disempowered by the system. And I wanna stress again that being disempowered is not my usual stance in the world. I am a very strong woman, as I said at the beginning of this talk, I would say, um, I, I know it's probably never wise to say who has the most power in a marriage, but I, I kind of am the one that runs our household. So I don't normally see myself as being the weaker one in our household. I have a tremendous amount of respect for my husband, and I don't feel disempowered by him, nor would I think that he views things that way either. I really strongly, through this process, even as shaken up as I was, really articulately advocated for myself and my family. And the sad thing is, it didn't do any good. No one believed me. Not the police officers, not the district attorney, not the victim's advocate who worked with the district attorney, several calls to her, not the victim's advocate that the police had call me several days later, not the attorney that we hired. And it really wasn't until we actually got a new, a new attorney way, way down the line, so probably a good nine to 12 months after this, that I even felt like anybody gave us any hope at all and listened to both my husband and I. And we have and continue to feel so alone facing this huge system over which we have no control. And what Linda said earlier, I can only reiterate that I never have felt like a victim until I had to talk to the police officers and the DA. In that circumstance, yes, I was a victim, but not in my relationship with my partner. I also wanna say, as I sort of said at the beginning, that I don't believe that families like ours are unique. I don't think that the situations or events of that evening are that unique. And I would really like for our systems to not make broad assumptions about me, us, or any family based on stereotypes or biases that I think are built into these current laws. 
And many of those stereotypes I don't believe are true because they weren't true for us. The silver lining to all this is that my family is doing well today. My husband's completed his court-mandated therapy. We've been completed, as I said, couples therapy. We are mending. It's taken a very long time, but we are mending in spite of the system. And I'm here because I really hope that in the course of this very broad conversation that I'm so pleased to see happening today, I hope there can be reforms. And I'm glad that there are so many voices speaking out for reform. And I would be happy in whatever way I can do to help move that reform forward. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>